episode 28, The Hidden Half of Nature, with David Montgomery and Anne Bickley. Welcome to Thriving with Nature, a podcast that gives you the tools you need to live a modern lifestyle that helps regenerate our planet. And now your host, Hayley Weatherburn. Hello, Thrivers, and welcome to this week's podcast. We have some special guests on here today. I want to uh, introduce you to the book. I have it on at Kindle. I would prefer it in a beautiful green cover. Um, It's called The Hidden Half of Nature. Now, we have the special authors here, David Montgomery and Anne Bickley. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, um, good to be here. Yeah, so I want to introduce you to these amazing, very wise, beautiful souls who have written this book. Let me give you a little summary. So David, he's a MacArthur Fellow of, 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 and Professor of Geomorphology at the University of Washington, internationally recognized geologist and the effects um, who studies landscape evolution and the effects of geological process processes on ecological systems and human societies. The connection there is important. Author of three award-winning popular science books and has also been featured in documentary films and much, much more. So very special to have you here, David. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Happy to talk to you. (laughs) And Anne, equally as amazing, is a biologist whose wide range of interests have led her into uh, watershed restoration, environmental planning and public health. She's an engaging speaker on public health and the built and natural environments. She has also worked extensively with community groups and non-profit on environmental stewardship. Thank you so much, Anne. Gotcha. <laughs> and this beautiful couple, in case you don't know, are actually married, <laughs> even are. though we're on separate screens. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just wanted to... Uh, before we go into it, just um, how did the idea of this book come about with the two of you together? Oh boy, do you want to do you want that one, or do you want me to start on that? Sure, I'll 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 start it, and then you can you can pick it up. Um, well, it's kind of interesting, Haley. We we set out to write a kind of a different a different book from um, from one standpoint, and that is that. We had, I, because I was the chief um, troublemaker on this, uh, I wanted a garden when we first bought the house that we're still in. And there was really, it was kind of an odd uh, house in Seattle in that there was hardly anything growing on our lot. And this is an average size city city lot for the Seattle area, which is around 5,000 square feet. We're a little bit larger at 6,000 square feet, but in any event, hardly anything growing there except for this old growth lawn that was filled with uh, dandelions. And at that, not even the nice kind, but the ones with these big stickers and (laughs) just not friendly at all. So I set about um, turning this sort of barren landscape into a garden. And after uh, several years of doing that, one of the things I had done initially was to bring um, organic matter in. And when I say organic matter, I don't mean that I was going out and like buying bags of compost and bags of this and bags of that. I had blown our budget on plants. Why? Because (laughs) I have a bad case of plant lust. And so there was no money to go buy a bunch of bags of stuff. So I started looking around the neighborhood, looking for things that were cheap or free. And lo and behold, there's quite a bit around you in a city in terms of organic matter that you can haul back to where you live and you can turn it into uh, mulches, Mm. different, basically different concoctions of organic matter. So the kinds of things I was collecting around the neighborhood were um, coffee grounds from the local coffee shop. We have a neighbor a block away or so has these very, very large oak trees. And in the fall, all those fallen leaves I gathered up. We also, Seattle, Um, has a lot of trees and so people are doing pruning their trees and I would have the arborist drop these free wood chips into the driveway so I'm mixing all this stuff up and I'm layering it you know four inches or so sometimes six inches onto the top of the planting beds and after um, a couple of years of doing this you know Dave is watching and and I'm 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 (laughs) enlisting his help on certain things and and at one point 
we're looking at the soil and he's like, hey, look at this. Wow, there's like, you're starting to build up a nice dark new layer of, of humus. And at that time he was working on another book called Dirt. And so in any event, the years, some years passed. And then we thought, you know, let's write a book about the garden and about the potential for soil in particular to sequester carbon. And that's where the hidden half of nature started out. But it was also at a time when the human microbiome, which, so what is the human microbiome? That's all of the um, microorganisms that are indigenous to the human body, meaning they're supposed to be there and it's mm. bacteria and fungi and archaea and, and, and even more. And so a lot of research was coming out at that time on the human microbiome and how important microorganisms are to human health. And, and Dave and I thought, uh, <laughs> it's not just human health that all these microorganisms are important for, they're extremely important as well for soil health. Mm. And then when you start looking at soil health, you realize, oh, plant health is intimately related to soil health. And if you have a wild setting or an agricultural setting and you have animals, the cows and the pigs and the chickens and the sheep, these animals, their health is also intimately related to the plant health, which is in turn related to soil health, which is in turn related to <laughs> the microbial communities. So. That is where this book kind of started. Yeah, that's that's amazing. It started in the garden and then your exploration. That's something that you mentioned. You wrote, uh, a, it's a well-known book called Dirt, uh, The Erosions of Civilization, if I'm not, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so while you were writing that book, you were noticing these things in your own, own garden. Yeah, essentially, you know, my, my background is as a geologist, and geologists tend to be kind of backwards looking, You're looking back through mm. Earth history, right? You know, trying to see, you know, how the landscapes that we occupy today were formed naturally. So I'd studied soil erosion for a long time professionally, but mostly in natural systems. Mm. And I had written a book called this Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations book that was a look at back at how the way people treated land had affected the course and fate of societies throughout throughout history. And the, the short summary is that, you know, societies that abused their land did not last. Mm. And so I was looking at, uh, I had looked at the way societies had degraded and destroyed their soil. And here Anne was in our yard doing the exact opposite of, you know, like building healthy, fertile <laughs> soil at a pace that, you know, if you consult the soil science literature, you know, you'd find that it takes nature, you know, centuries to build an inch of fertile topsoil. And here Anne was doing this over the course of years, not decades, not centuries. And that really spurred us into thinking that, oh, well, you know, what what is it that is uh, essentially allowing that to happen so fast in our yard? Mm -hmm. And uh, that led us into the world of microbes and the microbiomes in plants. And as Anne was talking about, the whole sort of human microbiome interest in that was exploding at the same time. And we started to realize that there are parallels between these two systems in terms of the relationship between microbial life and the health of the land and the health of our own gut. And that we could look at our bodies as ecosystems. And when you start looking at that, you start tracking all these parallels in the beneficial things that communities of microorganisms do to the host organism, whether it's around the roots of a plant system or within our own bodies. And that's what really sort of turned us from writing this book about the garden into writing a book about the hidden half of nature, which mm. the first half is, is about our garden and the land and the role of microorganisms and soil fertility. But it then takes in the second half, it moves into the, the realm of the human microbiome and the relationship to our own health and then tries to step back and draw the parallels between those two systems and to look at what it means for our view of nature and our view of the land, our view of ourselves, to think about um, the, the symbioses and the, the beneficial relationships between organisms that we, we normally have thought of as germs and bad things, right? Mm. There's all these roles that it turns out that the microbial world is playing in the macroscopic world that we can detect with our own senses that are kind of parallel to what we know of between say pollinators and, and flowers, right? There's these cooperative relationships where both parties benefit. And we can see that in the garden in the kind of animals that we're trained to think of as nat in natural history kind of a context. To think about that in terms of microorganisms mm. is a whole different, it's a game changer. 
And that's what really drew us into the thread that, that became the hidden half of nature, was trying to explore those two worlds and draw the commonalities between them and, and, and the real richness to that, those cooperative relationships. We, we've ten, we've, we're kind of trained to look at nature as a competitive business, mm -hmm. which it is, but there's a role for team sports in it as well. And that's where the symbioses come in. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a quote you say that I absolutely love. It says, diversity nested in cooperation creates dynamic systems that can stand the test of time. I absolutely love that. That's, that's exactly it. It's, it's uh, today in society, you know, I mean, you just have to look at the macro world right now. It's, it's, it's representing almost what we've sort of believed is in the micro microbial world, the competitiveness, the dog eat dogs, you know, there's, you know, separation. Um, and so mirroring the microbes, there's a potentiality where, you know, you discovered that it wasn't competition, that there was so much symbiosis as opposed to dysbiosis. I think that was the correct term. Um, inside the micro world it's it's amazing you the book you take us on a journey you take us through the characters of of you know in the 1800s of their discoveries the animal animal skills animal skills is that's the correct term right and animalcules animalcules yeah <laughs> animal i thought that was great um the i've, I've misplaced the who was the the um character that first discovered that his name Leywin Hook. Leywin Hook, that's right. Lewin. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, for those that are listening, you know, this is before the term microbes, I think, really existed. He, he you know, he got gifted a, a microscope and was looking at drops of water and started to notice these anim animacules. I thought that was a very cute word. I think we should keep those. I, I want that word to stay. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just go back. So for those people who, who um, haven't yet read your book, which I really encourage you to, um, the, the main premise of how do microbes support uh, plant health and ultimately the nutrition of what we eat? Mm. That's, a, that's a big question. It is that a big is question, a just in a small... <laughs> yeah, and it's an important question too. And, and I think um, as a gardener, this is something um, I'm really interested in because I want my plants to be healthy. I want them to be thriving. I don't want to be spending my time looking after a bunch of sickly plants. Mm. And what it turns out is that there's, you use the word symbiosis, and that's mm. definitely what is going on between the plants and the microorganisms that live in the soil. And it's all pretty much nested in um, nutrient cycling. And, and there's, if you think about it, there's sort of two, two basic kinds of food that the microorganisms in the soil really thrive on. And some of that is provided directly by the plant, like say in the form of fallen leaves or twigs or sticks or things like that. But there's another kind of food that um, most people don't maybe know about or that we don't think about it very much. And that is that these plants are pushing food out of their roots mm. right into the soil that is feeding these microbial communities that are not just any old sort of, you know, sorry, I have to drop this in or garden variety <laughs> sort of <laughs> microorganism in the soil. These are specialized communities that when they're feeding on these the food that the plant is pushing out of its roots, they're also, they're taking that food, but they're also supplying something to the plant in return. And that's things that the plant get, can't get. And so that might be phosphorus. That's, um, that's definitely one thing. There's been a lot of research mm. on, I call it the fetching fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi mm. travel, they can travel far away from the roots and gather phosphorus and they bring it back to the, to the, this area called the rhizosphere right around the roots and they exchange it for the food that the plant has. And so this is this, David mentioned before about the, the co-evolution between um, pollinators and flowers. And mm. I will tell you this, the co-evolution co between the root microbiome and plants way, way, way predates that between pollinators and flowering plants. I mean, this was the mm. first the first big symbiotic relationship 
um, between the botanical world and other life forms. It was what is living in the soil and how is the plant going to start up a relationship with those soil beings, essentially. Mm, mm, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, oh gosh, we could go in many different directions here. Um, but in a, in, a, in a summary, you mentioned, David, from your, obviously, your geological understanding that we basically come from a, a relationship of microbes coming together is that is that have I said that in I might not have I might have really summarized it <laughs> well, yeah if you if you go if you sort of go back far enough in the history of life um mm. you know how did multicellular organisms you know come to be uh and it was from the mergers of single-celled organisms single-celled microbes and there's this Wonderful story that we tell in the book of a, of a one of a, an amazing scientist from the 20th century, Lynn Margulis, who basically came mm. up with the theory of symbiogenesis, the idea that multicellular life evolved from the merging of microbes initially. And I forget, I forget the sort of the the whole sequence. That's why you write stuff down and put it in the book. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. but the basic <laughs> idea is that two microorganisms came together to form the first multicellular life, um, and the both organisms survived as a partnership, uh, literally as a physical symbiosis, as a physical merger um, that then sort of set the development of the evolution of plants and animals and fungi uh, in turn with different combinations of microbial life seeding those different branches of the world of nature that we sort of now know of as the macroscopic world that we can see with and detect with our own mm -hmm. senses. So in a very real sense, um, you know, when we, we subtitled the book, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health, Mm -hmm. And it's meant to be taken literally where the roots of life go all the way back to what you're referring to, the mergers of original microorganisms seeding the tree of life. And we sort of go through that story. Yeah. But also in terms of the, the, founda the foundational, laying the foundation for good health for both plants and animals, it turns out that the microorganisms that we co-evolved with that became our microbiome were relied on to play key roles in sort of keeping us healthy and providing nutrients and in terms of uh, benefiting our health as we went along. So those, those sort of two dimensions are the one, ones that we explore in the book. But yeah, you can trace the world of nature back to its microbial roots and you could kind of think of the world of life as this great flowering of diversity that came from the merging of micro microscopic life and then from the interaction of that life with those higher, with those so-called higher life forms. Um, and it's been a dance the whole way. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating how it's all came about. Uh, come about. I think the first idea where I, um, on a macro world, this idea of symbiosis was when I was in Africa and I was watching the the zebra or the zebra as <laughs> uh, and the uh, I think it was a buffalo. I can't remember the the other thing, but one is much better at smelling and the other is much better at seeing. And so those two herds stay together because together they're better. And so, you know, coming down into the, the microbial world, something, if we move into, we've talked about the roots and the plant health in our guts. This is something I didn't really, you know, go, was wowed about the fact that roots by themselves can't absorb nutrients. But humans, without the microbes, from my understanding, cannot absorb the nutrients either. It's the, the microbes that help that. Yeah, well, we can... We can absorb nutrients through our through our cells, but um, what what we can't what 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 our gut microbiome in part does for us. I'd mentioned the nutrient cycling that mm. occurs in the soil, you know, and the plant is providing some of that food. Our our gut microbiota do an awful lot of processing for us, and without mm. the kind of processing that they do we might not be able to absorb, you know, all of the nutrients in, in the human diet. And it's, it's not just that they're uh, say, you know, processing that potato you ate or, or something yeah. like that. They're actually um, what, what we now know is in the lower reaches of the digestive tract down in the, in the bottom, so to speak, um, you've got microbes that are fermenting um, fiber and the, where does this fiber come from? It comes from whole plant foods, so unprocessed stuff, 
right? The lettuce leaf, the strawberry, the even, you know, something like a walnut, but pretty much it's, it's generally the leafier stuff. And we don't have the enzymes to break that down. So it basically moves through almost all of our digestive tract and hits that lowermost part. And there we have herds of microbes waiting to graze on that stuff. And as they graze, they're churning out all kinds of compounds and molecules, uh, many of which have medicinal properties in the human body. Mm. And when you think about it that way, it's just, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing because, you know, we have access to all of this food in the human world and we bring it in and our microbes eat that as well. And in some cases they're turning the nutrients that we brought into our body into other things that are, you know, nutritional for us or have these medicinal effects. So, I mean, that's another example of a really, you know, tightly bound mm. um, symbiosis, because if we didn't have, if we didn't have these things, we would not be able to get all of the nutrients and all of the other things that they do with our food out of an omnivorous uh, human diet. Mm. So that, that to me was also really interesting. It was like, you know, that set of the set of nested dolls and you start with the the big one outside and you go in and in and in. I mm. sometimes think about the human, the human gut a little bit that way. You know, here we are, the human being in this world and in this environment, and we're bringing the food into one, you know, one set of mm. nested dolls, and then it's going through our digestive tract, and then it's getting into the little tiny <laughs> nested <laughs> doll and the very, you know, the very inner part there. Yeah. So it's um, the human diet is a really interesting thing to examine from the standpoint of our gut and the ecosystem that really, you know, is our gut as well. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah. That, did you want to add something, David, or? I was just gonna say that, you know, when, when, we, when we started to realize that you could look at what we eat really as the diet for your microbiome and what they do with it actually matters to our health, mm. it really put food in a whole new perspective, right? Because we're basically not just eating for ourselves. We all have our preferred foods and some of which are good for us, some of which are not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you start thinking about eating to support, you know, the, your microbial inhabitants and to try and promote the kind of anti-inflammatory work they can do and, and, try and, and suppress the inflammatory work that they can also do if they eat the wrong things, if mm. we eat the wrong things, you start looking at your diet in a whole different way in terms of, you know, how do you take care of those grazing herds of microbes in, in your colon? Um, and how do you provide them with what they need so that they can produce the compounds that your body can use to your benefit and to not be producing the kinds of effects or the kinds of compounds that work to your detriment. Mm. And, you know, I had been told for years, for example, that you'd, doctors would say like, you know, you should eat more fiber and be like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, why should I do that? I'm not very yeah. good at doing things because I'm supposed to, yeah. um, but when you understand why and you realize that, Oh, well, what you want in eating more fiber is you're actually feeding the fiber fermenting microbes that turn that fiber into inflammation suppressing compounds or to other compounds with medicinal medicinal effects for your body. Mm. You start going, Oh, I understand the reason why I would do that. And you start to then take better care of your those internal inhabitants. So to me, a lot of the power of, of sort of unraveling and unpacking this, the sort of the historical and scientific narrative of why should we care about our microbiome translated right over into, oh, well, because it really ought to color how we think about our own diet and what we eat and its relationship to health. Because we, you know, if this is a partnership with our microbiome, it's much better to have it to be a robust, thriving, uh, healthful one. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's funny. It always brings me back to um, uh, there was a, a friend in high school many many moons ago. Her name was Madeline, and she used to talk about the people in her body. She used, oh. used to believe she had all these little people in her body, and I always I, I never forgot it. And I, and it's it's come back so strongly, especially after reading this book. I'm like, there's the little people, our animalcules in our body that we've got to feed. <laughs> and so, <laughs> after reading this, I have to say it was like there was this slight shift. Even though I, you know, I'm very conscious about what I'm eating. Um, and, and but there was this new sort of sense of I've got to feed my microbiome. 
And so, you know, yesterday I had some coconut yogurt prebiotic with some sauerkraut to bring in some more people um, <laughs> and yeah. with a, a salad and veggies. I was like, here you go, guys. There's a, some more friends and some food to party with. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. So it's something I want to bring to light. I mean, it's amazing to find this well, but then there's this sense of like, oh, my God, what have we done? There's, you know... There's something that you said, in waging war against microbes for the last century, we've managed to unwittingly chisel away much of the foundation on which we stand. We, you know, um, I think it was, you know, the germ theory, which you talk a lot about, Louis Pasteur, and, and there's many characters involved in, in, in where we've got to today, but we've, we've taken this um, idea of, germs are bad like and and almost putting them all in that box oh any germs are bad um that we've ended up killing it all in the soil the, the world health organization says we've got less than 60 years left of of this soil that had all the life because all the chemicals we've gone and killed these amazing little beasties um antibiotics in our own bodies have also done the same thing um I'm wondering, I'm curious if you ever came across terrain theory in your, um, in your concept with, uh, let me just remember his name because I won't be able to say it. Um, yeah. Claude Bernard and Antoine Bouchamp, the idea, and yeah. I may be understanding it a bit incorrectly, but I think it was about rather than thinking germs are bad, it's actually the overall environment, the terrain that we need to look at. Do, can you share a bit about Oh, I mean, you're absolute. That's a fascinating concept, and you did get the name, the names right there. And it's a really different, um, it's a different way to think about uh, health and our and our bodies because we're used to sort of the Western biomedical model, which is, oh, let's go in and talk about your elbow bone, shall we? Let's look at this, and we look at that, and it's like, okay, well, the elbow is just one tiny little part of the human body. Mm. And so this terrain concept sort of asks uh, a, a way bigger um, and sometimes way more helpful question, which is what what is the, I also sort of think about it in terms of that um, wine concept called terroir, which is you think about your body as a landscape, as a place, it has terroir, it has terrain. And what is playing out on that stage? And if there's lots of things that are messed up about the landscape in the body or of the body, it's hard it's hard to have a normally functioning microbiome, you know, for example. And so if you can get the terrain right, if you can get, you know, I think about it like I have gardener friends that say, oh gosh, I'm always weeding my garden. And I always think to myself, I'm like, I can't even believe you're saying that. You need to have more mulch down there mm. because if you have mulch down there, there is no way that weeds are ever going to get a hold or if they do, they're going to be so puny and scrawny, you just give it a good stare, you know, <laughs> and it practically <laughs> dies off. So it's it's sort of what do we make of our bodies and this terrain in our bodies and how are we creating conditions that are either um, inviting of disease and ailments or how are we creating conditions that are taking advantage of our, you know, really some pretty amazing um, human systems like the immune system or like our nervous system and making sure that these things that we were born with um, can function normally and properly and that we're doing things uh, that safeguard them because really ultimately that's all we have is what our bodies can do mm. anytime you try to you know patch up the elbow bone or do something else it never just doesn't work as well as when things were working normally and properly. So I love that idea about, about the body being terrain because mm. it, it also helps us get, I mean, it's funny, you know, I like the micro world and I can also be a very detailed person, mm. but I like going macro because yeah. it's very good for getting a handle on things and getting mm. a perspective on things. 
Well, when you when we start thinking about our bodies as ecosystems, mm. it's kind of a different frame to put it on. And exactly. when we when we engage the with the microbial world, you know, a lot of what we've done in the Western world for the last well, 100, 150 years is to think of them as germs, just as pests and pathogens of things that, that are out to harm us, that mean us no good, that we need to sterilize right out of our lives. But when you start thinking about the kinds of beneficial and start learning about the kinds of beneficial effects they can have, whether for plants or, or in our own bodies, it's much more about community dynamics. It's, mm. it's typically not about a specific species. The pathogens tend to be about specific species, particular yeah. bad actors. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we've sort of framed the microbial world through that lens. But when you start thinking about it through, as an interacting system, a community of organisms, um, you know, we know that there are dysfunctional, we look at, at human communities, there are dysfunctional human communities, and there's very <laughs> thriving human communities. And microbes, you can kind of start thinking about them the same way, where the terrain matters, and who's there, and their interactions, what they're eating, do they have housing, you know, what kind of habitat do they have, what do they have to eat, how are they interacting, what's the community structure, mm. becomes sort of the, the, the way to think about them and look at them. And a lot, one of the lessons we learned from this book is that a lot of the beneficial effects that, that microorganisms have on their host organisms come through those community interactions with the host. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the sort of terrain idea of sort of laying the groundwork for uh, cultivating the beneficial life, whether, you know, what kind of practices that means for farming or the kinds of dietary practices that means for our own microbiome mm -hmm. really come into focus as the way we ought to be thinking about interacting with them to support their ability to support our health. Mm. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting if we, like you just said, Anne, if we stepped out and, you know, how would the world be different right now considering COVID if we had this view of the community rather than the one evil, um, right, evil virus? I'm, I'm curious what your, your thoughts are in, in, in this current situation. Yeah. I, I just, you know, wanted to highlight something Dave said, because I think it's really relevant to mm. dealing with the virus that's causing COVID, which is the pathogens do tend to be single actors. That's, that's how a pathogenic lifestyle mm. works. You don't really work in community with others to, you know, direct mm. evil. It's, it's <laughs> generally, you know, generally, you know, one, yeah. one pathogenic organism. And when I, um, when I think about pathogens, they uh, they tend to come, they tend to crop up, so to speak, when there are disruptions and when there are opportunities for them to do so. Mm -hmm. They're always lurking in the corners somewhere, and they're looking for a, a a time and an opportunity to come out of those corners and um, infect or take down or whatever their mode of, of action is. And we know, um, you know, that, that some of these microorganisms that have multiple hosts and viruses are, are one thing. We know that when we tend to get into the ecosystems where their other hosts are and we start mucking them up, whether that's draining a wetland or cutting down a forest or shoving a road through or building a dam or things like that, that in some cases, you know, it's upsetting to these pathogens and they're mm. gonna move out of those habitats and look for other corners to lurk in until mm. they can find, you know, the next warm body. And, and I think it's really hard for most people to think, to connect, oh, our disruption of these natural environments is now unleashing all of these pathogens that before were, were more or less kept in check, meaning um, it's not that they didn't infect organisms, but it didn't turn into pan, a pandemic. Mm. I mean, if every pathogen out there were able to cause a pandemic, human beings would not even be here. And what has kept most pathogens in check, you know, up until, you know, let's just say recent times mm. is there's lots of these communities, there's a lot of other life forms out there that are making life difficult for pathogens. And in essence, what we've done with our um, environmental disruption is we've made it easier. We've made life easier for pathogens to come out of natural environments and, you know, into our bodies and into our society and, and so on. So 
it's um it's kind of it's I mean, climate change is a wake up call as well. Mm. But I think a pandemic, because it's so directly uh, and in a relatively short number of months has completely upended our lives. Yeah. And it's a. Uh, it's something we should pay attention to and think about and and give us pause to ask, how can we start putting nature back together mm. so that, you know, we can thrive in it and we're not disrupting it to the point where it's, it's you know, taking all of life and upending it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's. My understanding in a, in a very uh, rudimentary idea is like you think of, um, this is a, an interesting analogy, but to get stronger, you have to tear your muscles, right? There's the, the, the negative. For in, I sort of see that for us to be strong, we need some about 15%. I think the, the ratio is about 85 to 15%, 85% to really positive, you know, common cells and, and, and the, the, the good microbes and then you've got the the some that aren't big, like I think people have certain viruses in their body but they don't show up and, and my my hypothesis is is because the stronger you keep the majority of your microbiome the the healthier you are and because as a society we've gone out and sprayed surfaces and disinfected the soils and disinfected everything this is that opportunity is that sort of um how is, well, have I hit anything? Is that right? <laughs> how I tend to think about it is that if you think about, you know, whether it's some surface in your body or, or the root of a plant, there's only so much surface area. Hmm. And to the degree to which that's covered with beneficial organisms, that's better for you or better for the plant. Hmm. And so if you basically go and you start to, uh, you know, super sterilize things, what, what comes back first? It's usually the weedy ah, species, the pests and yes. pathogens. And that, that holds for whether it's in our own gut or whether it's in an agricultural field. Um, it's the, the sort of fast growing opportunistic pathogens tend to come back first. So when we, when we indulge in using you know, broad spectrum biocides as sort of routine measures to try and control microbes, what we're doing is we're selecting for the bad actors. Mm, we um, are, and, we are, yeah. Right, yeah. Because when you think about it, these biocides, they may take out your target organism, but they're also perturbing and scrambling up the communities that of organisms that need one another. Mm -hmm. And because these communities need one another, they take longer to come back. If you're a single bad actor and the slate has been cleared, it's like, yeah, let me in there. This is, this is my time. I've got I've got a lot of surface area to occupy and colonize. I don't need anybody else to do what I do as a pathogen. Whereas the, benef the you know, beneficial microorganisms, they don't just do what they do by themselves. They do what they do in community. Mm. And so that takes longer to bring, to bring back. And it's something we should think about in our soils and in our and in our bodies when when we're you know kind of mucking about so to speak all right so we kind of have to keep in mind the sort of the dual nature of microbes there are pathogens out there that will do us harm and we need to we need mm. to essentially try and effectively manage our world to minimize that yeah. you know and things like antibiotics can play a huge role in that when we really yeah. need them um, yes. I don't think either Anne or I would be alive today without an antibiotics yeah um, but the flip side is that there are you know organisms whose effects are beneficial to us that we need to think about how do we cultivate them so that they're the ones that are overrepresented in our world relative to the pathogens. And so it's kind of a balancing act um, mm. in terms of thinking about how to uh, promote practices, whether in agriculture or medicine, that are going to, on average, lead us to a he healthier land or to healthier, healthier selves. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> I want to I want to bring this sort of all in together uh, and share with you something that I'm working on at the moment. <clears throat> but there's something that you said. You said some of the same species that inhabit the inner soil of our guts live in soils where they help suppress plant diseases. Now I'm currently working on a concept that I'm calling the living supplement garden, <clears throat> and essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, it's it's you know you place the seeds in your mouth 
um, before you're actually planting, you're inoculating the seeds with your own personal microbiome. And then throughout its growth, you're actually washing off your body it's toxins before you wake up, before anything else happens, not before you wake up, obviously, but after you, <laughs> the first thing you do after you wake up um, and you're washing your feet and hands into the soil and even um, at night time there's toxins. So there's this, I was talking to Dr. Elaine Ingham from the Soil Food Web about this concept and she shared um, a different view. I thought it was the toxins that were going into the plant that those microbes were reading, but she actually said that potentially you're sharing the microbes and that's something that you said the microbes same similar microbes exist in both both areas is am, am i correct in saying that or well if you look at the sort of the, the gross microbial population in most soils and in the human gut they're really pretty different there's some common actors mm. but most of it's really quite different and, okay. and the reason for that's pretty simple because outside there's a lot of oxygen inside us there's not Ah, right. So enough. you have so anaerobic species, uh, oxygen, uh, you know, ones that do not do well in an oxygenated environment tend to dominate in our gut, whereas species that are aerobic tend tend to dominate in most soils. You know, if it's a wetland or poorly drained soil, it's a whole different mm -hmm. game. Those tend to be really yeah. anoxic. Um, but if you think about where we got our microbiome in the first place. Sorry, you know, there's a mosquito. It probably <laughs> came through our mouths in the form of food that we were eating off of fallen fruit that were starting to rot, uh, tubers exactly. we the, you know our grandmothers dug up from the from the soil. I mean, there's this whole hypothesis in terms of sort of early human development of the sort of the grandmother hypothesis of the role of uh, matriarchal uh, um, tuber digging in terms of supporting human family structures that act, you know proto human family structures or before we were human as sort of a key point in human development. So there's there's been a long sort of history of getting things inside of us, but it's our, our microbial crew is a pretty highly edited and select crew of what may have started out in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, it's an interesting thought experiment to think about going back and forth between the two and to think about, you know, who might be who might thrive with that kind of with the kind of idea that you're mm -hmm. proposing and who might not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and Elaine knows an awful lot about that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's there's an interesting example of um, some research that was done on Japanese people and yeah. looking at their microbiome and researchers figured out that the some of the bacterial members of the Japanese microbiome were actually also the same species that were in seaweed that mm. was consumed by the Japanese population. And, and so this is an example of, of a food coming in that was coated with bacteria because uh, all food is. Mm. And as David said, you know, some of those bacteria were able to make the transition from, you know, an oceanic saltwater environment and into the gut. Other bacteria that come into our bodies, maybe they last a little while, but they are, they're edited and selected and selected mm. out. So it's a, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting thing to think about who got in us and who stayed, mm. who gets in us and stays for a little while, but yeah. just doesn't last that long. And who gets in us, but is just, you know, almost instantly eradicated. I mean, one thing that that we do know about microbiomes, whether in the soil or the human body, is that you you tend to have, it might not be the same species, but you'll have bacteria that will sort of do the same thing. So what I mean by that is you have bacteria that specialize in uh, digesting a particular kind of sugar, mm. or you have bacteria in the soil and they specialize in um, breaking down a particular kind of cellulose. And so you might find uh, cellulose degrading bacteria in New Zealand that is a different species than is in, you know, say Saskatchewan or mm. in Seattle, but they do the same, the same thing, but they yeah. just have okay. different names, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Yeah. All that, yeah. That's interesting. It's really interesting to think about because the hypothesis is that the plant will actually start to grow the exact substances that your body's condition needs. Um, so it's an interesting uh, uh, experiment that I'm on this journey at the moment. So um, yeah, I appreciate I think that's your thought. very intriguing. I'd love to 
hear from you again, like what you let you find out about that. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing all sorts of things. It's a, it's a journey. It's a process. Um, and if it's true, could really flip um, a few things. If, if we're, you know, just understanding how connected you talked about right at the beginning, the, the you know, the bumblebees and the, po- the pollinators and, and things and realizing that on this macro scale, that this, these, this plant, this tomato plant and I are actually that interconnected that if we wear that entwined, it's going to grow to keep me healthy just as the exudates and the, and the microbes at the, the root level. So, yeah, it's interesting. Well, yeah, the, uh, um, the, the book that Ann and I are working on now, um, <laughs> a, you know, it's kind of a follow-up to The Hidden Half of okay, Nature. Okay, great. Um, and hopefully we'll finish it in the next few months and get it out next in the coming year. But it's looking at how the way we actually grow food impacts its nutritional benefits to us, um, which is sort of looking at, at not just the organisms, but the effect of those organisms or what they mean for things like the antioxidants that in, in what we're eating or the, the phytochemicals or the mineral micronutrients how all that stuff gets either made in the soil or extracted from the soil and all the way into us, what's the effect of, of, of life and healthy soil sort of on those, on those transformations and transitions and deliveries. Mm. And it's been a really interesting uh, thing to put together, but it's basically pointing to the fact that we need to care about, you know, we need to care a lot more about not just what we eat, but how it's grown. How it's growing, 100%. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that book as well. Um, <laughs> I, I see we've, we've come to the time, and I just want to say to you both, thank you so much for your time. Time is precious these days. So thank you for sharing that with our um, thrivers. Yes? Yeah, and I just wanted that you showed, yes. you yes. had just had the <laughs> copy or whatever. So I just said, yeah, here's the... Look yes. in the flesh, so to speak. I would have been yeah. highlighting it left, right, yeah. and so many highlights. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, the hidden yeah. Half, half of nature, everyone. Right. There Microbial it is. Microbial roots of life and health, right there. It's a really if this this conversation sparked something to you, I one hundred percent recommend you grab it. So I will be putting links in the show notes for this podcast uh, and on the website as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us and. Um, I, Thrivers, have an amazing week. (laughs) Thank you, Haley. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yep, same here. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to my podcast, remember to subscribe to hear more. You also have to come check out the Living Supplement Garden, a garden that reads your individual's body's condition and grows the substances it requires to move towards optimal health and potentially healing your ailments. When we align with nature, we thrive with nature. I'd love to have you join myself and others as we discover the magic of nature together and strive to heal both ourselves and our planet. Go to thrivingwithnature.com.